funny. It's a shock. <laughs> Most of you would. So I have to ask you, what are you smoking? <laughs> it's hard. Uh, my name is Greg Marinak, and uh, a couple weeks ago I gave a presentation here called Starships, World Ships, and Interstellar Nomads. And we talked about a little bit of how hard it is. Why is it hard? Because the distances are unbelievable. They're unimaginable, but let's imagine right now. So let's think for a second. Let's pretend that our solar system is this quarter, this 25 cent piece. That uh, if that were the case, in the whole history of the human race, we have sent a machine from about the center of this coin to almost the edge of the coin. Because Pioneer and Voyager, maybe you say Viger, have gone <laughs> from this, uh, approximately the center of the solar system to almost to the edge. The edge is called the heliopause. And we haven't hit it yet, but we're, we're pretty close. The distance across this object is about a little more than 10 light hours. It takes light 10 hours to go from one edge to the other. So that's our solar system. I'm holding it in my hand. At this scale, at this scale, the nearest solar system, or the nearest other star, Proxima Centauri, is two football fields away. And the Milky Way galaxy, at this scale, is the size of the continental United States. So the scale's really amazing. So can we ever bridge those unimaginable gulfs? Well, we've taken our first baby steps, and if you come back to the Science Center on uh, April the 10th at 7 p.m., you can meet one of our neighbors who's been to space several times, Sandy Magnus. Astronaut Sandy Magnus will be over at the McDonald Planetarium. You're all invited to come and see Sandy, care of the St. Louis Astronomical Society, who's our partner in crime here at the Science Center. And, and she can talk to you about what it's like to go five miles a second in low Earth orbit. But that's obviously just skimming the surface. What about these huge gulfs? Is it, is it possible? And that's the title of tonight's lecture. Are starships possible? And to talk to us about it, we have somebody who's eminently qualified. Uh, he's the only guy I know who has a, a title which means rocket scientist at NASA. His actual title at NASA, he just has retired from NASA uh, after 30 years, it was propulsion physicist. How cool is that? Uh, okay, thank you. And uh, before I start the slides, just as another to try and get the sense of scale of things. He gave you one using a quarter of the solar system. Another one that I've used is if you imagine the sun to be a, a marble, you know, a normal half-inch marble. On that scale, the Earth is about four feet away, and the orbit around the moon is kind of like the size of a hole that's been punched in, you know, a three-ring binder uh, around there. Scale, the nearest neighboring star is over 200 miles away. In other words, if the sun had a flicker of light, it would take eight minutes before we even knew it happened. We have a, a news uh, forum called Centauri Dreams. Centauri as an Alpha Centauri Dreams as in, in Dreams. If you Google that, you'll find our news blog. Um, we have a volunteer journalist who keeps up with the scientific literature. Uh, and anytime you see something that's relevant to interstellar flight, and there's been a lot of exoplanets discoveries and things like that um, in the near term. Exoplanet, by the way, means a planet not in our solar system. And the numbers of exoplanets discovered are into the hundreds now. Um, but anyway, getting back to that. Um, and that will also be the place where uh, developments of our foundation will be done too. Now the foundation itself, what happened is, is when I was at NASA, I did these far out things initially on the side because they were cool, they were mental stimulating, and over the years started to meet other people that were like-minded. And we started a professional society called the Interstellar Propulsion Society back in 1993. And shortly thereafter, uh, I was asked to create the Breakthrough Propulsion Physics Project, which really threw me, I was not expecting that, um, based in part of the stuff that we were doing already, to do that for NASA, which completely uh, surprises because we weren't thinking that this subject could be taken seriously until after there was a irrefutable discovery of either a breakthrough space drive or a fast light effect and it's like oh, okay um, 
So over the course of doing that, and there was a NASA program that was actually funded for about seven years uh, to work on this stuff, um, I met a lot of people. And the types of people that I enjoyed working with the most are those ones I've described as pioneers. And um, they also have the characteristic, aside from just reaching beyond the comfort zone of their peers to explore questions that we don't have the answers to, they could also do the work rigorously. And I can't tell you how many people I've met that can be visionary and not the least bit constructive. And those that are very rigorous and prude and don't have no imagination. But the people that can do both at the same time are a rare breed and they are cool to work with. And once you realize that you all kind of share the values, we just started collaborating. And as things went on, that became more formal and more formal. And as I was getting on in my career at NASA, and NASA was becoming um, retro, uh, they were trying to repeat uh, the Apollo type of things again, but without ever really being given the budget to do it. And um, when my boss assigned me to go back and read papers from the 1960s about talent tanks, and that was an opportunity for an early retirement, I figured, well, maybe even now my time to do that, and take this one the side group of people that we had um, and turn it into a nonprofit foundation and then see through donations if we could actually accelerate progress. And the way it started is that we would use those minor donations just to help fund our travel to present papers on this sort of stuff at conferences that normally we wouldn't be able to afford our way to. Um, because most of us that were working on this, we had other day jobs, and we did this on the side. And for a brief time in my NASA career, this became my day job. And the thing that, uh, well, that actually kind of surprised me is I was apparently good at it, which I, I was not expecting that, and it's still kind of weird for me to um, kind of come to terms with that, because after I started to get a little bit famous for this, and had my first TV interviews and stuff like that, I thought, oh geez, well, I should act like someone who is in a role of that important stuff, and I tried to do that and just didn't work out. And the odd thing was, is I did my best work when I was just kind of doing average stuff. And that's really kind of hard to grasp that when I'm just kind of doing what comes naturally for me, it's in this category, and wonder, why aren't more people doing it? It's, it's a, a weird thing. I can well, anyway, with the foundation, it's like having other people that are in that same kind of category working together. And one of the other kind of twists of fate, if you will, um, we realized that you know we're probably going to make more progress with this. We get away from the, the rest of the space program kind of people and just pick you know interstellar flight is so far in the future that it won't get caught up in all the arguments about do we do moon first or Mars or what have you, and um, and the government's not going to fund it. And I retired in February of 2010, and in October of 2010. DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, in other words, uh, Department of Defense Research Wing, they decided they wanted to do a 100-year starship organization and um, launched a whole thing about that and even had a, a competition for who would run it, and we did not win. Um, so now it's like, okay, now what do we do? And uh, I'm still thinking about that. Um, we are still going to be continuing in whatever uh, degree we can. Um, but. The way that we're trying to tackle this, myself and my cohorts, is one, we're trying to make sure that we understand the problem well enough. Two, know what progress has been made to ask what's the next logical thing that we can afford to do. We're not into designing starships yet or trying to launch missions, but just do that incremental progress. And also when we do this, we're trying to be as reliable with the information. In other words, not tell you the stories that we think you want to hear, tell you it like it is. And one of the things I didn't go into right here, but when I did an estimate of comparing how much energy it would take to do an interstellar mission, or regardless of what method you did, compared to how much energy does human humanity have, and how much does it devote to uh, space missions, how long would it be in our history where it looks like we'd have enough energy to do that? And the answer I came back with, which I was not expecting, was two centuries, which is still a long time. And um, you know, I, you know, when I think it's like, well, as we continue as a society, are we going to last two centuries more? You know, should we work on this a little bit quicker now so that we uh, don't kill ourselves? Um, I don't know, but, that's, but anyway, coming out with those answers as they are, and the findings as they are, and the other parts with that, as we do this, 
through our Centauri Dreams Forum to try and connect to the public where they are. And the other thing that we have started ever so slightly is to try and engage universities, um, trying to break down these specific problems. And it's not just the uh, propulsion physics, there's also someone stretching the technology part of what would make good graduate student uh, dissertation topics and try and work with their university to where their advisor will agree that the student can work on one of these interstellar uh, questions and we will help them get started by giving them the initial reference information and some advice from our experts and then from there the school and the, the student find their own funding do the work and uh, report it well so that that strategy too of trying to spread the seeds of the work and the um, actual uh, uh, progress and enthusiasm to a lot of colleges and we only have one student so far at the university or excuse me at the Air Force Institute of Technology and we were in the process of starting that um, we're trying to do that at other universities we've got about five universities who committed in addition to that who've committed to wanting to do that um, it's now just the other follow-through details of trying to do this so that's the things that we're actually trying to accomplish and if you want to keep up with our progress the news forum again is Centauri Dreams. Along the way, we saw more of these veins. So we figured, well, we could stop for a few days and take a look at those. And in fact, we stopped at this one here, as we see in the next slide. And there's what it looks like. So here's about the, its real size. I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. I'm probably putting my finger over it. Uh, it's about an inch wide, a couple feet long. It's more resistant to erosion than the uh, surrounding rock, so it stands up in, in vertical relief. We put our instruments down on it to see what it was made out of. It turns out to be high in the elements calcium and sulfur, and correlated in such a way that it's probably a mineral known as gypsum. Does anybody know what gypsum is? Calcium sulfate, what do we use it for? It's probably all over your houses. She wall, right, exactly. And on Earth, we, we do find uh, this mineral forming in these vein like uh, situations where uh, enriched, water enriched in dissolved chemicals move through veins and deposit material. And here's what it looks like in close up. Again, uh, this is about an inch or so across. And if you look, maybe it's a little hard to see, but if you look in detail, you can see a very fibrous texture. And so apparently the minerals started precipitating along the edge of the fracture crack, and it grew across the crack and eventually filled it all in. So um, it's very strong evidence that there was water, uh, liquid water, could have been associated with uh, the formation of the crater and hydrothermal activities, or it could have just been groundwater systems moving through. Again, it's another case where when spring comes, we want to try to examine more of these, figure out where they occur, uh, how big they are, and what they look like, and, and what their chemistry is. All right, so wintering at Cape York. So this is kind of where opportunity is right now. On this diagram, there's this thin white line that showed us driving up to the north. Right about there is where we found the veins. And we finally found this spot here, which turned out uh, the engineers really liked because it had uh, a nice tilt to the north. And we've been able to maintain our, at least, power to do some science during the winter season. So this is what we've been doing. Uh, we're sitting on this slope that's tilted to the north. We use our color camera system. We're making this 360 degree uh, panorama. As you can see here, it's kind of a work in progress. Um, and we're using our arm to measure the uh, chemistry of the rocks in front of us in a couple different spots. And also trying to make a long, thin mosaic from our microscopic imager, again, about an inch and a half on each side here. We could do two across, and we're hoping to do about 20, so it'll be a couple feet long by a few inches wide transect across this rock park. Another interesting thing we're doing, it's hard to show as a, a diagram, 
we're doing what's called radio science experiments. So the rover has a little dish antenna where it can broadcast directly to the Earth. And one of these huge antennas, the largest of which is about 70 yards across, there is three places on the Earth that NASA has these facilities, one in California, one in Spain, and one in Australia. And it listens to the, the rover signal and tracks how much the frequency shifts from um, <clears throat> when the rover sent it out, basically a Doppler shift, uh, because the rover is moving with Mars as it turns. And that information can be used to figure out the position of the pole of Mars. And this experiment was done back in Viking in the 70s, Pathfinder in the 90s, and now with MER in the 2010s. And so we could track for changes, very slow changes in the position of the pole. And that tells you information about the size of Mars's core, what it's made out of, and whether or not it may be solid or liquid. So it's a very hard to do experiment, and because we have to be parked for a couple months, we're able to uh, contribute to that uh, experiment. Curiosity is somewhere between the Earth and Mars, somewhere in the solar system. In August, it will land, and we'll show you what that looks like, on Mars and where it's gonna go. So if, and I have some pictures coming up, if Opportunity is kind of a small golf cart size uh, vehicle. This is kind of a monster truck in comparison. So, and, and we'll see what that looks like. And I understand John in the back there told me that uh, later this spring, the planetarium should have a full uh, uh, model, life-size model of uh, Curiosity. So check out the announcements for that and come back and take a look at it later this spring. All right, so the instrument package on Curiosity is a lot different from our. It's not just sending the same space, spacecraft to do the same things, uh, only bigger, but it has a, a different set of instruments uh, than MERC. So it, it does have a mast with cameras, and I'll come back and show you about this one, ChemCam, in a minute. It does have an arm, which you don't see very well here, that has cameras and an instrument to measure chemistry. But inside the body, it has uh, basically an analytical laboratory. It has an instrument that could measure chemistry, including organics. It has an instrument that can determine mineralogy, something Merck cannot do very well. Um, and then it, could do, it has a, a small meteorology station. It, it can measure... Uh, uh, look for uh, buried water layers under the ground. So it will be uh, able to do a much more sophisticated analysis of uh, materials. And this to me looks pretty cool. So one of the instruments, as I mentioned, ChemCam, is actually an instrument that shoots a laser out onto rocks and turns a small spot into a plasma and then a spectrometer can look at that plasma and figure out what elements are in the plasma. Um, it, it has an acronym, Laser Induced Breakdown Spectroscopy is the, the fancy name. And uh, I put this in here because it reminds me of those transformer things. <laughs> Again, give you an idea of uh, 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 what this thing is like and how different it'll be. So the idea behind ChemCam is that it can as the rover is driving around and it sees interesting features, it'll be able to shoot its laser off and get an idea of what those rocks are made out of. And then the team can make decisions on, of all those different rocks, which are the most interesting to go and, and look at and spend time and collect samples and do analysis. So that's something that Murr didn't have. We had to kind of basically use images and drive up to rocks and, and taste what they were like. Okay, a little bit of the overview of the mission. It was launched back in uh, Thanksgiving, right around Thanksgiving. About eight months to get there, as Doug mentioned earlier. And eventually when it gets there, it's gonna land on this contraption, which is a first time activity. Somebody asked me, is it gonna work? And I said, ask me in August. I'll tell you if it works. Uh, it's called the Sky Crane. So 
the rover will be suspended on this tether beneath it, and uh, this thing has retro rockets. That's of course after the thing has come through the atmosphere with parachutes to slow it down and so forth. Uh, this will be system will be deployed. The the rockets will lower the uh, rover near the surface. Uh, and then this tether will be cut. The rover will land on its feet, ready to go, and this thing will then fly off into some safe distance away and crash into the surface. So again, we'll know in August how well it works. Um, the reason for something like this is, as I mentioned, Murr landed with uh, airbags, like in your car, that had the system, and when it got close to the surface, the airbags inflated, and it bounced and rolled along the surface. Murr at about 400 pounds weight was at the limit of that technology. This is about five times heavier. So uh, something different had to be designed to be able to get that onto the surface. And this slide is kind of a family portrait of rovers on Mars. Uh, this tiny one is the so Sojourner Truth rover, which went with Mars Pathfinder in the late 90s. And it's about the size of a desktop printer that they all have in your office at work or home. There is a model of Spirit and Opportunity, as I said, about by golf cart size. And here is this monster truck thing known as Curiosity. Uh, a little more comparison. Here's a Murr wheel that's about 10 inches tall. And uh, the, the Curiosity wheel and the, the uh, uh, Sojourner wheel. And those who are familiar with metric can do the conversions in, the head, in their head. Pathfinder, about 23 pounds. I did this on my calculator today. Uh, <laughs> we're about uh, 400 pounds, and this guy is close to 2,000 pounds or so. And another comparison to show you how big <laughs> that thing is. I'm sure we all know how big a Mini Cooper is. OK, well, where is it going to go? Uh, this slide shows us uh, in yellow where other spacecraft have, had landed. Viking 1, where my wife met Jean Roddenberry at that time. Viking 2, where actually she met Mickey Dolans, for name, <laughs> dropping names. Uh, Pathfinder um, in the late 90s. Spirit and Opportunity. And then Phoenix, which I haven't mentioned, which landed uh, in the polar region in 2008. Being up in the polar area where uh, once it became fall and winter, there was, and being solar powered, uh, there was no way to operate the spacecraft and it didn't survive the winter. And then these white dots are the candidates for where uh, uh, Curiosity was going. Gale Crater, Everswald, Holden, uh, Marth Vallis. These three are craters that have uh, thick layers of sediments in them that appear to have been altered by uh, water processes, and Marth Vallis is a valley structure that also has lots of altered uh, rocks. And the winner is, any guesses? Gale Crater, okay? It's about 95 uh, miles wide, and what's unique about it is it has this thick pile of sediments in the center. Okay, how long does it take to get a, a command from uh, down on Earth to like move the arm or move the uh, Typically, uh, uh, commands are done for a, a, a whole Mars day. Well, my wife told me I had to explain a SOL. Sorry. Um, yeah, some of those slides mention SOLs. That's what we consider a Mars day. So for MER, for example, our opportunity, we send commands to reach the spacecraft in the morning, and it does its thing, and then telemetry is back the data in, in the afternoon. So one-way light time depends on where the Earth and Mars is in, in their orbits around the sun. Right now in opposition is the shortest time, and it's, I don't know the exact number, I'm gonna guess around five minutes. But if Earth is on one side of the sun and Mars is on the other, that could take up to 20 minutes or more. I've also got a question. <laughs> has some inconclusive results on its biological experiments. There seems to be almost a, an aversion of any kind of biological experiments on these rovers. And I, I realize there's a trade-off between what you can keep and what you can't. Why don't just 40 years later have some simple biological tests? 
Um, yeah, the Curiosity was uh, a set of instruments that were proposed by PIs in the science community and then NASA selected what it thought was the best combination. The one instrument, the uh, gas chromatograph mass spectrometer instrument, known as SAM, uh, that would at least detect organic compounds if they're present. So it's not biology, but uh, it's a step for that. Come up to this year, right here. This may even be related. Uh, there's been recent reports of remote sensing showing methane plumes on Mars that may or may not be related to <coughs> biological activity. Is there anything on the uh, the new rover that will be able to confirm or deny that this is methane and, and you know its possible biological origin? Right. The thing about the methane is that it kind of was in the mind. If yours goes out, I'll give you mine. Um, the, my understanding is that the methane needs to have an active source because it breaks down in the atmosphere. So that, that's the excitement about that. The, the same instrument I mentioned, the same instrument, has the capability to take in some air, and methane is an organic molecule, so it should be able to detect that if it's present. There was a, um, a mission that NASA wanted to fly with the Europeans, uh, that had several instruments to pursue the idea, but the most recent budget that came out. An orbital? Uh, yeah, there's an orbiter, yeah, for okay. 2016. Take this one right over here. All right, um, could you maybe tell us a little bit about what the elemental makeup is that we've found so far on the surface of Mars? Okay, um, the, if you look around the entire planet, most of the rocks are what we call basalt. Uh, you know, go to a volcano here on Earth, sp spitting out lava like Hawaii or someplace like that, and you're going to find rocks that are basalt composition, made out of silicon and oxygen, uh, some aluminum, iron, magnesium, calcium, minerals, uh, elements like that. So overall, that's that's what a typical rock is made out of on Mars, the volcanic rocks. At Opportunity, we see uh, in the soils some basalt fragments. The, the rock outcrops are sulfate minerals. Uh, sulfur, oxygen with water, cations, probably magnesium, iron, maybe calcium. Let's see, let me think. They were Opportunity and Spirit were launched in summer of 2003. I would say they started making them two or three years before that. So, and, and a lot of that time, uh, you know, you have to design what it's going to look like, you have to build it, and then most importantly, you got to test the heck out the heck out of it because once it's up there, it's really hard to send a repairman to fix it. <laughs> got one up here on the front row. Here you, here you go. What is the expected life of the new rover? The new rover? Um, the design uh, life is one Mars year, which is maybe a little less than two Earth years. Um, the design life for the uh, Opportunity in Spirit was three months, and we saw how long they lasted. And this one, since it's nuclear power, as Doug asked earlier, uh, we're not constrained by getting, you know, seasonal effects of low power or dust. Um, so unless something major breaks, it could last a lot longer than that. Given your track record, yeah, you're ahead of the game already. Okay, one from right here. In addition to the uh, the switch to nuclear power for it, uh, what would you say are some of the other major uh, engineering and also science instrument uh, decisions on the Curiosity rover that, that are directly related to either challenges or successes from the, uh, the MER rovers? Um, yeah, other than the, 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 uh, the power uh, situation, I think uh, the ability to do real mineralogy is a big plus. So on uh, Opportunity and Spirit, we had an instrument that measured elemental abundance. But chemically, you don't know how these elements were mixed together to form minerals, okay? 
you can get an idea of it by you know make, make a measurement here and offset a little bit and see which elements change in, in concert with each other. The MOS power tells you about iron minerals, but in general, there's no instrument on the MERS to measure mineralogy. We'll have, we'll have to do chemistry. But Curiosity should be able to tell us minerals, which would be a big, would we'll, we'll remove a lot of ambiguity in our interpretations. Got one from back here, anyone? Come on, I'll get you. Just think of how much more money you could make if you would sell space. <laughs> I mean, think about it. All the local television stations, they have uh -huh. advertisers. Pepsi or logos or something. Exactly. <laughs> or like NASCAR. You, know, you <laughs> slap a whole bunch of them on there. Makes a money the program. Uh, is there any testing for seismic, seismic activity on the planet? Oh, and good one. Also, back in Apollo, they rammed one of the landers into the moon. And it, and it's one sec, per, this person said it rang, rang like a bell. All right, good question. Um, Viking actually had seismometers, uh, each Viking lander. But they were mounted on top of the, the lander deck. One of them actually didn't work. The other one was mounted on the, the top of the deck. And in analyzing that data, the best they can confirm was they detected vibrations of the spacecraft moving around due to wind blowing against the antenna. There is and has been proposed for a long time uh, missions to deploy a network of seismometers on Mars. It just hasn't gotten off the ground yet. Uh, I think there's, there's one proposal that's working its way through the NASA system and may get selected or not in the next few years. Anybody else? Or around here? Okay. Will Opportunity be abandoned once Curiosity comes online? No. Uh, no. I say no, but uh, doing this for over 30 years, you never know what NASA's going to do. I, I think there would be a huge outcry if NASA said uh, we're going to turn off Opportunity. Um, and, and why, I mean, budgets are tight, but why would you? You spend all that money to get it up there, and it, as long as we could still do good science. I mean, there may, may come a time where it's still working, but only one or two instruments are working. And, you know, you can make the trade-off then that it's not worth keeping it going because it's not returning much science. But as long as we can demonstrate we're doing good science, I think we'll be okay. How many people are right now working on the rover that's still functioning, even though it's wintertime? And how many of those people are going to be diverted to Curiosity? Um, a lot of the people that are going to work on Curiosity have pretty much already moved over to that because that team is in the process of doing uh, operational, what they're called operational readiness tests. So they're practicing on how they're doing operations and doing the commanding and so forth. And the MER team has over the years gotten smaller and smaller. We've certainly learned how to do the commanding a lot better so we can do it more efficiently. I would say the team at JPL is probably a couple dozen people. The science team is still pretty much intact, and, and that's probably 50 scientists and lots of graduate students, even undergraduate students, help us work on this project. How did Opportunity and Spirit get on Mars without a lander? Um, they, they were in this little cocoon thing structure that on the outside of it had airbags, like in your car. Hopefully you've never had to be in a car where they've deployed. Um, but when it got close to the surface, it was coming down on a parachute, and the airbags blew up, and then the parachute cord was cut, and it fell to the surface. It bounced and bounced and bounced, rolled a little bit, and eventually stopped. And it was automated so that the airbags would deflate, and the pedals of its lander opened up, and then it, it drove off its uh, uh, lander. Curious about the software power. I, I think back to the very first time man landed on the moon, and most of us who have a cell phone in this room, our cell phones are computer-wise light years ahead. What's the difference between the existing rovers and Curiosity as far as that computing power is concerned? The MER rovers um, actually have, uh, the old timers may know this, basically equivalent to a 386 computer. <laughs> um, 
part of that is, you know, this thing has to be, you mentioned in the beginning, it's, it's not a fun environment to get out there with the radiation environment. So it has to be a, a piece of hardware that's proven. And that was what we knew worked to get Pathfinder there. And so it was used again for her. Turned out to be pretty darn slow. And you know, when we take a picture and process it, it takes a minute or so to get it compressed into a JPEG like you would have on your cell phone. And um, you know, that's the price you pay. Curiosity will have a much faster process. What's the estimated cost of this? Um, Curiosity, I think, is on the order of $2 billion, if I remember correctly. Murder to build two of them was about, and to operate them. Some of that money is also to operate them once they get there. It's figured in the budget. Murder was about $800 million for the two. A bargain. Hi, uh, life and water and things like that, was, has there been conclusions that, uh, made by, about that? Clearly water that the climate of Mars was different in the past and supported liquid water. You see that in the way the rocks were altered chemically. Also, we see places where water has moved the, the sediments and produced distinctive features. Life is still an open question. And one of the main drivers of the Mars Exploration Program is to look for evidence of environments that are right for, for life habitation, either life that might have been there or maybe some kind of precursor like the old organic soup idea so at some time in the past. A couple more minutes so we can slip a few more questions in here. Go right in. What's the limiting factor in this instrumentation? Is it your power source? Is it the motorized activity or is the instruments just fail all the time? Talking about the rovers, the first. Um, power is a certainly an important constraint on how much we can do. Uh, we started when we first got there in relatively clean solar panels operating in summertime, something like a thousand watt hours a day. Um, but that has to be shared between the science instruments, uh, heaters, running the computer, the telecommunication system. So today I think the power for opportunity or that it generated on the last day was about 300 watt hours. So if you have a 100 watt hour light bulb in a lamp at home, turn it off for three hours, that's about it, it's about much power. Um, and you know, you saw the list, some parts have more now. We're way past their expected lifetime on the motors and the actuators turning. Um, and you know we do our best to kind of preserve, uh, you know, moving the camera bar around and so forth, trying to minimize those motions because we are way past the tested lifetimes of these things, and any one of those important systems could break at any any day.